So I was wondering if you could start just by telling me about your background and what made you end up working with cryptocurrencies and blockchain specifically. My name is Jutta Steiner. I'm the CEO of Parity. Um, I started this company three years ago together with um, Gavin Wood, who was one of the original co-founders of Ethereum. And I myself used to work for the Ethereum Foundation, um, looking after security before the launch of the Ethereum platform. Before that, I have a background in applied math. Um, so I spent quite some time at uni, um, worked a bit in consulting after my PhD, and then got more and more interested um, basically at around the time of the Snowden revelations, um, interested in like what's actually happening online, what's happening to our data, like how does this all work? And um, I ended up reading a lot, um, accidentally came across MateSafe, um, which was an early project in the space as well, and then um, saw people discussing Ethereum in that context about four years ago, like how, how to use it for access management of data. And, um, and then, yeah, um, met the Ethereum people. This is how I got involved, basically. So it all started with Ethereum for yeah. you then? Yeah, I mean, I had read about Bitcoin and it was like interesting to me, like from a math perspective. And, um, but I didn't, I only realized like the potential when, when I came across these discussions of like, what, what can you actually do with Ethereum or already like this level of abstraction, um, yeah. So why don't you next tell us a bit about your relationship with Ethereum, both personal and business, of course. We want to hear about Vitalik. Back at the time, I got interested in, like, what can you actually do with it? Like, this whole data perspective was interesting, but then also around the same time, I met Jesse Baker, who was just starting a company called Providence, um, where she looked at sort of pr trying to... Um, create like a Facebook for product products, like bringing transparency to supply chains. That was sort of the idea. Like, what's the history? What are the people processes behind products? And we started to speak about like how could you use blockchain and in particular Ethereum. And um, and I ended up sort of doing this and working for the foundation on on security. So um, working with external researchers, making sure that. Um, certain attack scenarios are analyzed in a bit more detail before the launch of the platform. So that's what I did, um, like, initially. But then, basically, by working on Providence, realizing that really the technology isn't there yet where it needs to be in order to be, go mainstream. And so um, out of that frustration, Parity um, came out. So as a company where we wanted to further work on the fundamental technologies um, and, and push that forward. So which kind of nicely... Um, ties back to my math and science background, so um, being able to push um, to push the technology on that end is pretty pretty good fun. And so, what's Parity doing now that's new? Because I'm just doing googling before this, I saw that you guys have the Polkadot yeah. blockchain platform now. Initially, we we started with a clean slate um, implementation of Ethereum um, when we started Parity, just to like basically taking all the learnings um, from um, the early days of Ethereum and, and coming up with a new implementation. And then over time, like through the different products, projects that we did and the different discussions we had, we understand more and more like what it is that is needed to, um, uh, to bring the technology to a state where it can actually be used. Initially, um, the ideas evolved a lot around just pure interoperability. Like a few years ago, the discussions about private chains and public chains started. So it seemed sensible, it also seemed sensible like as a way of optimizing scalability. Like think of uh, when you have parallel chains where certain clusters of transactions are being processed, like, and then you have interoperability between the chains, that's one way of scaling a system, right? Um, but then over time, like um, things like scalability, uh, sorry, things like um, governance became also more of an issue. Um, and, and we really started thinking about like, what is sort of the next level of abstraction that we need to bring to this technology in order to make it much more general, much more um, easily to adapt to solve for all these issues. And, and that's why Polkadot or the technologies around Polkadot um, sit right now. So Substrate is a technology that we, are, um, that we just released um, in a POC state. There's a test net. Um, it's a very general framework for spinning up um, your own state machine. So if you think of 
initially you have Bitcoin with uh, with a platform that where you could do payments basically, um, if you want to think of it in that way. Um, then with Ethereum, you you got this like general um, platform for building decentralized applications, and then now with um, with Substrate. Um, you get a framework for spinning up your own decentralized platform, so spinning up your own Ethereum, your own um, your own Zcash, your own Bitcoin, and and because they all use the same framework, framework by default they interoperate, and and that's that's where where that's the problem that we are trying to solve at the moment is like very technical engineering, um, basically creating these frameworks like peer-to-peer -peer technology and um, networking and like there are all sorts of elements and it's really not that easy to build them all together that they work. Yeah. Okay, so this might be kind of a stupid question. I mean, I understand everything you said because I write about crypto a lot, but to our YouTube audience or to people, could you explain what everything you just said in like one simple sentence? You know, like what does Parity do? What does Polkadot do? So what we're doing at Parity is coming up with a fundamentally new way of building online services. So the way how the web has evolved and applications on the web is everything we do, every service we use, um, we always have to rely on centralized servers where all our data is hosted, where there's like an authority that decides on like how, how does the service work, what happens if there's contention, like it's, it's always like push to them or like they, they are in charge, they have the authority to decide. Um, and and what we're trying to build is basically a system where there's much more agency on the user side where there's um, less of a divide between service provider and the people that use the services. So um, that it really becomes a much more open, much more uh, much more peer-to-peer -peer way of interacting with each other where we don't have to go through Facebook, through Google, but instead have um, like seamless interacting with like our friends or whoever we want to interact with. So that's like Web 3.0. That's that what we call Web 3.0. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The next level of the web. Yeah. So how long do you think it would take before we actually would enter the Web 3.0 era? Because it took us a while to get to Web 2.0. So do you have a, like a time time frame for that? With Polkadot specifically, we're aiming to release um, Polkadot at the end of next year. Now, that doesn't mean we already see applications. Um, I think that that's going to be a gradual process. I mean, there are things you can use already to make your applications more decentral, more peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, there's some solutions for having interoperability, like cross-chain transactions. I hope that um, over the next few years, we're going to see the first implementations, applications that fundamentally use this. A lot of what we have to solve evolves around um, usability and user experience, and this will probably still take a bit. Um, also, there is sometimes like an, an advantage in having systems a little bit centralized because you can have a massive efficiency gain um, in certain cases, and and we still haven't found out like where we have to make these trade-offs, like how central, how decentral should things be? Because if a system is completely decentral, that also means as a user, I have a lot of responsibility. And what are the right ways of putting in um, redundancy uh, so that when I lose a private key, like which is the access to my wallet, like I still can move the cash or the, the money I have in the wallet. So what would you say to someone that says, you know, I don't know what you're talking about with this Web 3.0, I like using Facebook, it's comfortable, it's familiar, I don't care if they take my data, I have nothing to hide. You know, what's your argument to people that would say that? If, hard, it's, if people don't, don't see like what the underlying mechanisms are that uh, make systems like Facebook really not like the perfect systems to interact with. Um, but I, I guess like the recent um, revelations around uh, Cambridge Analytica have shown, and in particular have shown the governments how powerful these plat platforms have become, um, which like the hearings um, have shown, like there is a lot of um, spotlight now on on all the services to come up with answers and like, because like governments feel the interference that, that come through um, through these services. And I, I believe we're gonna see regulation that will play in favor of decentralization to a certain extent. 
Um, and we've seen that in Europe already, um, like with GDPR, so the Directive on Data Protection, although there are some questions around like how this interacts exactly with blockchain. I believe like on the political side, there's a, there is a lot of will of um, making sure we don't give power to quasi-governments that are completely unregulated. Bringing up the data privacy bill, I know some blockchain companies have expressed problems with it because of the whole right to be forgotten. And the whole point of a blockchain is that nothing is ever forgotten. So how do you see that contradiction playing out? So I think we, we I mean, I hope we'll, we'll see um, clarification from regulators and from, um, from lawmakers over the next couple of years. Like in principle, I see that like, the people that believe in blockchain technology and the people that were behind the GDPR have a have a huge set of common goals, basically giving power back to to the users. And um, it's basically unfortunate that the drafting of the GDPR came just before blockchain became a thing, and so it became way too specific in the way it was drafted. I mean. Politics can be slower, but I would hope that um, people will recognize the, the, the potential of the technology and therefore, I don't know, create sandbox boxes or like actually find a way of just leading to more clarification. So what do you think is uh, maybe an example of a country or regulatory framework that they're, they're doing everything right? Does that exist yet? I mean, Switzerland was interesting because um, it's a, like it's a small, like small countries have it easy, right? Or like easier because um, they... They, they've always like struggled with retaining, maintaining relevance, and so they had to be more agile and adapt to changes in, the, in their environment much more quickly. So I think we're, we're going to see a lot of um, regulatory innovation or like um, regulatory competition between countries, which helps um, entrepreneurs to a certain extent but then only so much as like this is all global, like this is technology that we're building for the entire web. So even if you're complying in one country, that doesn't help you necessarily. So um, still, it gives you a lot of assurance. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I've seen anybody who does like everything right, but it's it's quite good that the, the fact that people are mobile these days and that they just move around wherever they can build their business um, has led to regulatory competition. So this next question is changing the subject a bit, but I saw you retweeted the other day um, kind of a meme about women in crypto, where the media is shouting, where are the women in crypto? And there's a woman in crypto shouting back, like, I'm right here, um, and they're not listening. So I'm sure, like, my question is, how many times do you get asked about what's it like being a woman in crypto? I get asked frequently, like, my perspective on, on this and, and what needs to be done. And, and then I guess my... My frustration with that topic comes a lot from, um, often those discussions are very nuanced, but then in the end, all that gets printed is like, just a complaint, like there aren't that many, or like the, the, top, like the main topic of the article is then all the Lambos, and I don't think it's helpful. Like I, I believe it's more helpful to just talk about the work that people do and like see that as like I don't find it as inspiring if I see people just like driving their Lambos either like that would, wouldn't have been the reason why I would have come come in and work in crypto but instead like seeing people that just work in the space and becoming like interested in the topics um, that's why what I believe should be talked about. My next question is about the Ethereum and the frozen wallets um, that happened well, a while ago, but it became a news topic again in April because there was the Ethereum proposal to reverse the hack and it ended up being, or not the hack, to reverse the freeze and ended up being voted down. And I was wondering if that's something that you guys at Parity are still thinking about, how to get the Ethereum out of that frozen library or if it's kind of like it happened, it's done, we're just moving, moving forward. So we're still, um, I mean, there are a lot of efforts in within Ethereum to come up with um, answers like how to fix the issue of like governance just in general and um, the reason um, why governance is an important thing is because have, if you have like an answer to this like it's easier to um, to come up with ways where you um, decide on like contentious issues like whether you want to like do a hard fork or whatever to to unfreeze the funds. So 
Um, and I believe this is a fundamentally needed debate because we haven't figured this out yet. Like, how do we actually want to want to govern um, decentralized systems? And and that's what um, what we are trying to work out with the community. Um, I do believe if you want to encourage innovation in the space, you need to make sure you don't discourage, discourage um, ex experimentation. Um, like the optimization that led to the uh, to the freeze was a very sensible optimization back at the time. Um, it became clear it will be an issue um, like transaction throughput, the cost of transactions, and we made an optimization that would lead to less cost if you deployed a wallet. Um, and the truth is, like the tools that we need in order to write smart contracts, safe smart contracts, aren't there yet. And so, um, not not finding an answer to like, and and the parrot, the wallet freeze wasn't the only um, issue that happened where people lost access to their funds. Like there were other issues, and I still hope that we find a solution um, where um, where like bugs in infrastructure that led to um, people losing access. Um, will be fixed in a um, in an adequate way. Today, during the TechCrunch fireside chat with Vitalik Buterin, he mentioned something about recovering frozen Ethereum funds by doing a soft spoon. And I was wondering if you could explain what that phrase is, if I even got it. A soft spooning isn't exactly a way of um, recovering. Like what you do with a soft spoon is you basically use um, whatever the current state is of a chain, say Ethereum, like who owns how much Ether, what is the state of the contracts and whatnot, and use this as a starting point for a completely new chain. So, um, and then obviously you have all freedom to propose um, also changes to that state. And in that case, what you could do is you decide to fix the buggy, um, buggy library contract. Um, and so all of a sudden that would become um, accessible again. So basically um, in a new chain, um, maybe, maybe like an Ethereum 2 that's proof of stake based, you would start with a clean um, state where all known bugs are fixed. And that's what, what's, what falls under or like some solutions like this is what's called a, a spoon. Like you just take sort of the state as as inspiration for the state of a new So you're like chain. scooping it up Indeed. like a spoon. Yeah. Okay, got it. What does a normal day in your life look like? Oh, um, what's a normal life? I mean, it's a, it's a mix of like all sorts of ta tasks, like meeting the team. There's like a lot of, a lot of travel, going to conferences, speaking, um, meeting with partners. I mean, I guess there's no typical day, um, but um, yeah, I mean, the company also has changed over, over time. Like, we are by now um, around 50 people, and so we need to finance like, how we scale our company internally as well. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the topics that are on my plate. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.